This isn't your typical motorsports podcast. You're listening to Crush This, a monster truck podcast presented by High Octane Coffee and J Concepts. A show where we take you inside the minds of your favorite drivers, past and present, of the monster truck industry. And now, your hosts, Brad Shaw and Dan Chichagash. Buckle in. The show starts now. And welcome everybody to a brand new episode of Crush This Live. My name as always is Brad Shaw, aka the Monster Truck Conducker, and the guy being all weirdo and everything is Mr. Dan Agosh. Dan, how's it going, buddy? Stan Cheech Agosh, get it right. Dan anyway, Cheech Agosh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, you you get it right. Anyway, what's up? What's happening? How's how's everything going with you, man? Thank you for, by the way, uh, for doing the show alone a couple days ago. I had some family up and, uh, you know, got invited to supper, me and my girlfriend, and I had some fun time with family. So, hey, thank you for doing that, man. That means Family comes first, Brad. Remember that. Always oh, family. The heart and soul and, of everything that goes on. And also, um, today we're supposed to have Brian Loans on. Unfortunately, uh, some arrangements came up with Brian. He had to go do a NHRA divisional race up in Epping, New Hampshire. Um, we're going to be having him on, having him on September first. Uh, tentative date for that episode, but uh, Dan was able to get a uh, guest here. We'll introduce him in just a moment or two here. But uh, oh. Dan, how's everything going in the uh, Hall Brothers Racing Camp? And also, Dan's Look reminding me. <laughs> My fingers <laughs> matching all the. I wish you could continue on. That'd been pretty cool. Hold on, hold on. let me, let me but, start. Thanks. There thank, we go. Thanks to High Octane Coffee, Joy Sylvester. Awesome stuff. We also got J Concept. Ah! Cheech is wearing the J Concept shirt right now. Speech up. Uh, Back Channel Productions with Nick Davis. Go check out the awesome footage that he's been uh, being able to uh, bring for us all. Uh, Chris with 6P Apparel. Awesome shirt. Some of the best in the business. Softest, best uh, quality stuff. We also got uh, Marty Garza and his book, Monster Truck Technology. Hopefully, I'll get that for Christmas. And we also got JB Scale Graphics, the only... Uh, licensed graphic maker of RC Douglas Four. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna remember. Uh, bad habit against the grain. Bigfoot overkill evolution and. Uh, oh man, I always forget. Obsessed. Bad new. Uh, what? Obsessed. Obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> I I always forget. Like there's. Uh, there's one I'll always forget. <laughs> I love it. <how> <laughs> But, but, Dan, how's everything going in Illinois? How's everything going with the Hall Brothers? You guys have been doing a lot of dealerships uh, coming up here. Um, mm -hmm. You guys were been lately in Des Moines, Iowa, and also up in Pennsylvania, I believe. Um, no, we're getting the ball going? rolling. Yeah, getting the ball rolling right now. We got a couple uh, dealerships coming up pretty soon. Uh, the last thing I know also is the Indy Four-Wheel Jamboree in September still on the go. Same thing in October for Lima, Ohio. Uh, just announced as – Last Tuesday, Ram just came out with the TRX, uh, their version of what is supposed to compete with the Raptor. Um, so we got kind of a little bit of a big push. Uh, so that's exciting about that right there. Um, also, um, we are still, like I said, we're still doing dealerships. Uh, we're getting booked for that still too. But then again, uh, with the Corona and, you know, everything that's going on, it, you know, hit or miss so right it, now it, it limits what you guys are able to do and not do right you know, certain, so it's a climb but it's right now a steady uh, and then steady and then sometimes down but we still so it's not as impactful like it was last year but still our wheels are still turning but you're able to go out and you know take the trucks to displays i know uh, i believe last weekend you were with uh mark and in the weekend before you're with um kurt for the hot seat one and, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's awesome that you guys are able to go out and do a lot of that with the jamborees and such as well. Um, and yeah, like I said earlier, you were able to get a last kind of minute guest, uh, after Brian was not able to make it and, um, man, what a guest it's a, it's a guy that kind of both of us grew up watching. Um, it's on, it's an honor to talk to him. So why don't you introduce him, Cheech? Yeah. Uh, this guest, uh, he was my boss for a while when I was in monster jam, a uh, pretty cool guy to talk to. Uh, man, he, he drove from SIR to, uh, Steve Sims trucks all the way to the legendary grave digger, um, and all the trucks between, uh, this guy is also pretty good behind the guitar. And, uh, he was a very awesome competitor, very awesome racer. Uh, 
and one actually people when I released the news, he was supposed to be on a lot later episode, but uh, he was willing to uh, work with us and uh, help us out for Thursday. That's today. Uh, but uh, that's none other than Carl Van Horn, CVH. How you doing today, sir? Great. Good to see some old friends from the monster truck world. How you guys doing? Yeah, not too bad. Not too bad. Just enjoying a rainy kind of night here up in uh, Northern Canada. So, uh, you know, excited to have you on. You know, I remember, you know, being a little guy watching, you know, Monster Jam on CNN. That's when I first started seeing you in the, uh, what was it? Uh, night, what was it? The, the, the Tetra Child. Fire Mouth. Fire Mouth. I couldn't remember. I was like thinking Nitro Fire something, but I, that's when I first uh, started hearing you. But let's go back to the beginning of your career. That's kind of what we, we start, always start off with and how you got into the Monster Truck world. You know, how did everything start for CVH getting into uh, this wild, wacky world that we call monster trucks? Well, I grew up, I live and grew up right 30 minutes from the Gravedigger shop. So, uh, but before that, I already had a CDL license and, and well, basically my stepdad owned some trucks. So I got a CDL and my real dad owned a shop. So I knew how to do both. And that was what you needed back then. You needed to be able to work on the trucks and have a CDL to haul them up and down the road. And when they had an opening, a friend of mine, Fletcher Lewis, told me about an opening there. So um, he got me in there, started out as a crew guy, did that for two years. And when they had an opening out in the in a seat, which was Spider-Man, they put, I think, five of us out in the field to test. And, and I got lucky and got the gig. So I started driving Spider-Man in uh, 2002. And it, that was... You know, that was that was pretty huge. So when you said something about TNN, I was thinking about my first show with Spider-Man. I was able to I actually lost one round, but they had the fast loser bracket. And I came back and I won. That was my first stadium show, first TV show and against Tom Mintz in the final round and, and was able to win. So that was a, a huge accomplishment in my rookie season. In our uh, first ever uh, live uh, video, we talked to Frank Krimmel. And he, he drove a lot of, I think he has the record, I don't know, but of the most Monster Jam trucks or Monster Trucks in general driven. And we were also thinking off the air, I was like, I think you were probably a close second. Uh, and outside of Spider-Man, you jumped around a little bit. Uh, you know, was it was it hard for the company to find you identity or they just basically need you to fill in any seat that was available? Um, I drove most of those trucks when I came back because I left, I left the okay. company for a while and, um, well, they threw me in Firemouth for the O2, was it the O2 World Finals? Yeah, this, no, maybe the next year. I don't know, but I got, I did the Firemouth just for a few months and I think that sponsorship went away. It was just ending or something, but, um, I ended up leaving the company and, did a little deal with Pablo Huffaker for with Blacksmith for um, it was just a five month deal. And um, I wasn't ready to move out there, you know, so so I wanted to be back with the family. So I did that five months driving Blacksmith, which was an awesome experience. I learned so much from them and uh, came back and, and I ended up going to work with Randy Brown after that, um, driving pure adrenaline because that was closer to home. Um, you know, and I was the second guy in the trailer and I knew my role. I, I probably drove a little too hard sometimes before that role, you know, try not to wreck it and, and let the headliner make the money. But, you know, I guess um, I just I always wanted to drive harder. So I ended up back at the company driving power forward. And, and then anytime they had something, I was a salaried employee. I'll put it that way. So <coughs> if they had somebody they needed to to throw in a truck here or there, just like Frank Krimmel, it's always easier to, to say, Hey, can you go out here last minute? They got already got to pay extra for a last minute flight. They don't have to, so they're saving money by using us. And, you know, we wanted to drive anytime we could. So most of the time, I don't think we ever said no, we just did it. <laughs> Do you remember that moment where they, they brought all you guys to the digger shop to test? Do you remember like that, that moment that you, you, you're, you're strapped in, you fire the truck, you put her into first, then like, what was that moment like? Was it kind of like, were you, were you a fan growing up, up until that moment? Or, you know, what was that, what was that moment for you? Like when you first hit the throttle, like, man, 
I'm I'm hooked. Oh yeah, and and I had driven a little bit before that test. Most of us had done a little bit like shock testing uh, Lyle Hancock, which was he was the uh, driver I was crew chiefing for before I became a driver. Um, he had taught me a lot. So, and he had put me out there in the field and, and let me do shock testing and things like that and, and gave me little tips in, along the way. But um, it was still every time you got in there, you're just, you're just hooked even harder, you know? So in that test, when I did the, uh, the testing with five of us, you know, I knew I had done well. I just had to, I could, I was, I was doing everything that it was, they were asking me to do. It was like, you know, you ever have one of them days where everything just goes right. That was that day. You know, I, I had one thing that maybe wasn't, wasn't so great, but it was still okay. You know, and everything else was, was on it. And it's I hard to find, as a driver, it's hard to find them days when you're, you know, them weekends when you're out driving, you want every weekend to be great, but it's just not, it's not going to happen. So let's talk about uh, Lyle because you were his crew chief, but he, I'm assuming he also mentored you a little bit behind the wheel. How was it having Lyle Hancock basically being kind of a coach to you? Oh, that was a great experience. I mean, you know, one of the most experienced drivers back then was was teaching me. So what more could I ask for? You know, it, it was uh, it was really good. He he taught me he taught me by by telling me what not to do. You know he always told me that I had natural talent. Um, but you know, what he didn't know was all the stuff I was, with all the stuff growing up, you know, I was always on go-karts and stuff. I didn't race professionally, but anything, anytime I could get on anything with a motor, I was on it. Any cars I owned, I was sideways down dirt roads, you know? So, so I had, I had some background, um, but, but yeah, Lyle taught me a lot and helped me helped me get started it was a huge impact so let's go back to that show that you were talking about you know um where you came back as a fast loser you're in the final round against tom mentz and so how were your nerves coming into that event you know you you, you did your testing you're you're out here in spider-man and you're in the final round against probably one of the most decorated monster truck drivers of all time and tom mentz what was that experience like for you was it Kind of like, you know, were, were you nervous going up against Tom or did you have, you know, you know, quite a bit of confidence going into that? I did. My confidence was growing every round just because of the, the I just felt good. You know, it was another like I was talking about before. It was one of those nights where everything was going great and I was and I was in the zone. And so any driver will tell you, if you get in that zone, nothing, nothing gets in your way. You're just totally focused. You don't get nervous. You're just focused. And, and that's when you do your best and when you get the most out of your equipment. And that was that night I was on it and, you know, Tom was always on it, but I think he went into the turn a little bit too hard, got up on two wheels. You know, it was, it was over then. All I had to do was stay straight. <laughs> yeah. Let the ship sails, of course, you know, to yeah. the finish line. And, uh, you know, you, you did, you look back uh, in the timeline, pushing forward with power forward and stuff like that. But how did you, uh, there was a certain time period before you, your second hiatus, uh, actually before you started your third hiatus with Monster Jam, you did time with uh, Steve Sims and his group. And then uh, what a lot of people may have to say was uh, probably, uh, your, I guess, you no know, getting popular or, being notified was with Sun Impact Racing. And uh, tell us a bit about that transition from company and and uh, to those seats. Yeah, um, man, I, I was actually, I was in Gravedigger in 2005. I was, uh, I was really, I was happy. I was enjoying what I was doing. Um, I went, I went to them and, and asked for more money because I'm trying to, you know, support a family and be on the road. And, and, uh, and there was none to be, none to be given. So, you know, at that time I could get a, <clears throat> a local driving job, driving a tractor trailer for almost 10 grand more than I was making driving grave digger and driving the rig. Um, so I don't want to, hopefully I'm not ruining anybody's dreams that this is a, um, you know, millionaire 
sport or anything, but darn it. <laughs> Long, story <I'm> out. <laughs> Long story short, um, you know, I told him I was going to have to go and, and then uh, got a call from Brandon Lagarde and he offered me even more than what I was going to make there. And it was a good deal and offered to uh, put me in T max and, and off I went to new Orleans. So, uh, that was, that was a great experience. Got to work with Tim Bush and, uh, and John Zimmer, you know, we had some great times up and down the road in the, the big white Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, being able to, I think the first show in that I went in, I went to Florida and I was driving T max and I got the flu and I was, I was literally throwing up between rounds and, somehow one one but you know that was uh brandon always talked about that after that so like, yeah <laughs> if i could do that good when i wasn't sick it'd be great <laughs> so, so so talk about you know the the mentality you know you're coming from you know i believe at the time it was clear channel um and coming to an independent team you know and and sudden impact you know they're one of the top tier independent teams at the time and so you're coming from, you know, driving Gravedigger, and now you're driving T-Max. What was that transition like for you? Was it, did you find it a little bit more easier and more relaxed kind of an atmosphere at Sudden Impact? Or did you have just the same pressure on yourself that you would have been when you were driving Gravedigger? Um, most of the time it was less pressure, but like if I was at a Monster Jam show, I wasn't Gravedigger, you know, so I didn't have that pressure and I, and I did enjoy that. Um I felt like I could maybe experiment with some things more where times in grave digger, I was scared to experiment because if it went wrong, then, you know, I'm shorting the fans. I rolled over cause I was trying something new and we didn't have a test field to go do that back then. But, uh, but yeah, as far as some of the summer shows we did, I was still the headliner. They would book me as grave digger driver in T max, you know, and, so I was still headlining, but, but you know, it, it's, it's a different deal. Also, when you're driving for an independent, you're, you definitely, you gotta be more uh, conscious of, of parts breakage and things like that. So I had to try to drive accordingly. And, and uh, sometimes I did well. And sometimes I just tore way too much crap up. Your teammates with SIR, it was stacked. I mean, you got yourself, John Zimmer, Sean Duhon, Kevin King, uh, John Killinger, John Killinger, yes, uh, Sean other, Duhon. All right, said Sean Duhon. Oh. Um, anyway, uh, having them as teammates and traveling around, uh, it also got to step up everyone's uh, driving abilities, but also um, just being in shows, like you said the camaraderie of you guys got to be great. Oh yeah. Yeah. We always had fun and um, things were more laid back, you know, back then. And we, we could have more fun. We could play pranks on each other and do silly stuff, you know, and, uh, and then come race time, it was, it was on. Nobody was, it, it was all about who could get to the finish line first. Then we weren't looking at, at our, who was friends and who was enemies. It was, it was on, but, um, we always had a lot of good times and, and everybody on the road is like family. You guys know that you get to know everybody at the track and, and, uh, and it's one big family that you see sometimes. Well, you know, before the tours started, like, like monster jam started tours where everybody stayed together mostly, but we used to go all over the place. So you didn't know you would be with a different, different group of trucks and people this weekend and next weekend it's a totally different group and you might run across the same group three weeks later you know but you got to know everybody that way so um how was it you know did i'm not sure like the chassis you ran in digger back then but how was you know transitioning from a truck that you were used to the, a, a truck that you know is kind of somewhat foreign to you was it an easy transition yeah, and, and in general, you know, going from a different style truck to another truck, do, is it a hard transition sometimes getting into like different seats? Um, I think it's more in our head than anything. 
be honest with you, unless you're going from like a the old school higher engine farther back, like an old school Patrick chassis, which was a great chassis for its time, you know, and then um, when you go from that and jump in a low motor monster jam chassis or, you know, everybody's making them now the low motor, more, more center of the truck. Uh, that could be a, a little bit more of a, an adjustment, but it's still, you know, you could adjust to it pretty quick. Um, I used to love the old intros, you know, back when grave digger or whatever had to go out and do an intro or like, just like Vegas, you would see them go out and, and you're kind of feeling out the truck and the, and the turns when you're going through there. But, you can you can figure out a lot just by doing that before the show ever starts. Now, one thing I always thought that was pretty cool is you being behind the wheel of Excalibur for SIR. Um, and then normally when I think of that, I always think of MLMT, those uh, courses that you guys ran like in Charlotte, Bristol, Nashville, you know, all the NASCAR tracks. Uh, how was that experience for you? Because those were all driver tracks. They weren't just the standalone stadium or standalone arena. These were over over and unders. And, and Rick Schaefer did an amazing, amazing job on uh, doing the track building. But how was that experience doing that league? Those were awesome, man. I, I really enjoyed those tracks just because there was so much more driver element involved. And – uh you know, you had to be, you you couldn't be scared. You know, when you go across that big, I can't remember what he called that, that jump with the big opening. You you couldn't uh, you couldn't let off of it, or you would you wouldn't make it. But um, those were great tracks, and and I enjoyed it every every one of them. Well, especially in the MLMT, you guys had you know a great lineup of trucks, and you know. Yeah. That was one thing that I always thought with the, the a league like that, with a lot of the independents, that you know, at any given moment, anybody could take it, especially with tracks like that. Like one bobble in a turn, you know, you could be done. And that's what I, I feel like, you know, it's like the typical Monster Jam, you know, Chicago style tracks or other tracks, you know, it's kind of like not even a, hardly a driver's course. And the MLMT, like Dan said, we're driver's courses, and I feel like that played into a lot of people's uh, advantages in that time. Yeah, that's true. Um, it did, and, and you know, your setups were going to affect things like, you know, when we got when we went to the China Towers, there was a there was a big traction difference from the the Heenans that we had before that, and and I understood the reason for the China Towers. You know, that was trying to get something that was. Um, that monster jam could use something for less breakage or whatever, but, but less traction is you, you had to change the way you're driving. Especially there was, there was one engine we had in T max that was pretty healthy. It was, it was the most power I had ever had at that point. And, uh, and you put a set of China towers and when you leave the line, you can't hold it to the floor anymore. You're basically sitting there watching people drive away from you. So you had to learn how to roll off the throttle, roll onto the throttle and get us, you know, get just the right point so that you're not losing too much. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a tricky adjustment there to, to less traction going from something like that to less traction. Um, what was the other question you had about the, uh, oh man. Well, I was like with, with, with uh, the MLT with it being such a driver's track, you know, anybody could win at any moment. And then with the lineups that, that were around at that time, you know, it was like Andy Hoffman could like eke out a win or like somebody that you don't even expect would it be able to win because the tracks would be so just complicated. And, you know, what, what, when you guys first started seeing these tracks, what was your mindset going into it? Cause it's just, some of them were just insane. Oh, it was just, you just had to feel it out. You know, and I loved it. I love a challenge like that where, where it's on the driver, you know, I didn't win as many of them as I would have liked to have, <laughs> but, but I still loved it, you know, whether I was winning or not, um, it was something different and, uh, and definitely, definitely really cool. Um, and I was going to say, when you were talking about the monster jam being the, the Chicago style courses, some of those, you would be surprised that some of those 
how much the driver could make a difference because depending on the trucks, there might be five or six drivers in a show that you really got to worry about as far as figuring how fast a lot of times it's how fast you can figure out what to do on them tracks. So, so when you're, there might be one drunk, one jump that's a little bit higher than the other and you want to hit the low jump twice. So you want to start on that lane. You know, there's some, sometimes where you got to pedal a little bit on the ramp to stay low. Other times you want to hold it down, you know, it's how fast you could figure it out because you don't have, you don't have but a few rounds, you know, and you're in the finals. And if you don't figure it out as fast as the other guy or gal, then you're out. So they, they could be trickier than you realize as far as the Chicago's courses, they just weren't as fun to watch. So, and also, I mean, was the setup, uh, setup got a, when you did the MLMT stuff, Obviously, the jumps that you're racing on are freestyle obstacles in general. So, really, yeah. between racing and freestyle, the setup must have been not that critical of a change, was it? Not really, um, especially. I mean, if you had a truck with valves on the shocks, then you were just going to crank them in a little bit for freestyle. That was pretty much it. Um, the only place we made that I remember making major adjustments would have been Vegas, where you shorten the limit straps and do and gear changes and stuff. But, um, and uh, like if it rained at a show somewhere now that you MLMT too, if it, if it was really slick, you might want to gear up higher, you know? So how was it uh, driving with uh, the Steve Sims team? There's a, actually a comment here um, from Pat Roy. He says, uh, I remember all the insane slap bullies you did at Stafford in 2008 and Mopar magic. Some of the longest wheelies that track has ever seen. Talk about your time there because, you know, it seems like, you know, like, like Dan was saying in the beginning and when we were talking to Frank, you, you've driven a lot of your trucks in career more than I re actually realized at, at times. And how was that experience working with Steve Sims? That was great too, man. And we had so much fun together, just like Randy Brown too, with them guys, um, Steve Sims, we always, joked around and, and had fun and, and did silly stuff going down the road, laughing all the time. And, uh, and that truck Mopar magic, that was a wheelie machine, you know, it had a little 20 inch shocks on the front, I think at first. And, uh, so it didn't have as much travel. So it, it, it was a little easier to get slap wheelies. And, and I took advantage of that every chance I got and, uh, and had fun with it. And, you know, I got to work with Tommy powers, another, really experienced guy that was with Dennis Anderson for many years. Um, so I got to learn from him, you know, so that was during my time trying to figure out where I was going to end up. You know, I had all these great people that I learned from Lyle Hancock, Pablo Huffaker, uh, Randy Brown and uh, Steve Sims and Tommy Powers. So, man, I, I had a lot, a lot of knowledge around me all the time so so i didn't have any choice but to learn so with you you being with steve sims how did you get yourself back with monster jam and getting back in the seat of a grave digger oh man you're testing my memory now <laughs> <laughs> well well before that i, I was uh it's looking Cal at uh the, yeah the, the the Wikipedia, there's a monster trick Wikipedia page or whatever. And you went from uh sudden impact to the Steve Sims team. Then you went to sudden impact for yeah, uh, again. I forgot you went a second stint. The second one was a flying gig. I'm, I'm pretty sure where I was flying in and, and John had the truck ready and stuff. If I remember, no, wait, no, I'm, I might be wrong, but I remember because Jacksonville, the picture you posted on Facebook was Jacksonville. 2010 in Excalibur and uh yeah and I was I was with them maybe I stayed with them for first quarter or something and then flew it in says after. you were there from uh 2006 to 2011 so um and then it says in 2011 you returned to uh the digger team but uh yeah it was the end of 2010 I went back to um Monster Jam and I had worked out a deal because I was, I was trying to trying to be home with family as much as I could. I was trying to figure out how to do this, do what I love to do and be home with family more. Cause nothing I was doing was really working. 
I, mean, I remember the second time um, some memories are coming back now from when I went, when I tried to do the flying gig with, with uh, SIR and I had a tractor trailer. I was trying to haul containers during the week and then I would have to run a certain amount of days to pay the insurance it was like three days, at least three days just to pay the insurance and the bills on the thing. And then, then I'm flying out doing monster truck shows. So that ended up being seven days a week. So it's like, man, nothing's working here. And I talked to, I ended up talking to Mike Wills. I said, I'd be interested in coming back, but I want to look into management. Um, you know, maybe just a shop foreman or something like that. And, uh, start thinking about less travel, you know, well, even if it meant not driving as much, I was ready to just be at, be at the shop more. And at that time, the, the grave digger shop was still in North Carolina. Now, before we go further with the grave digger and the, the in Feld, I have another question about uh, basically running Excalibur or an SIR truck at one of the last monster truck shows at the Pontiac Silverdome. Uh, I believe that you were at the very first of the last ones. Uh, there was a video, I think, of uh, Shock Therapy and uh, Excalibur doing some donuts at this uh, intro type deal about the, the Pontiac Silverdome. And uh, I'm just wondering, uh, were you there for that? Or if so, how was that experience? It seems like I remember doing them donuts. I can't, for some reason, I don't remember the show. I must not have did very well. <laughs> <laughs> that's how our memories work. We remember the wins. But, um, yeah, I just, I, it just makes me think of the Pontiac Silver Dome and the history there. And I remember being there with Lyle Hancock because he had the, the built Ford Tough Ford there and um, just tearing that thing up so bad that when we finally got it loaded, the sun was coming up, you know, so those were some long nights uh, back in the day before the parts got as good as they are now. It was, there was a lot of those nights, a lot of them, but, but yeah, I don't, I can't remember that event uh, particularly, but, but I do remember the building and, and being there several times. It was great. So you returned to Monster Jam and you know, immediately we're back in a digger truck. And how was that experience, you know, coming back after, you know, quite a bit of time off from Monster Jam, you know, being part of the company and they put you right back into a digger truck. You you said you wanted to be in management somewhere, kind of, you know, working behind the scenes somewhat. So when they brought you into, you know, driving again, what was that? What was your kind of thought process when all that was uh, happening? Well, they wanted me to drive. Uh, the grave digger truck, but it was basically going to be just first quarter deals, you know, maybe a show here or there. So I would still be, I'd be flying out. Well, no, I was, I started out, I was still going with the rig um, in 2011. And, uh, and I would be getting into management when I came back and basically the rest of the year. So that was how that deal was supposed to work. And it, and it pretty much did for the most part. Um, I was a shop foreman and then, went from that to shop manager as the, the Florida building um, when Felds bought the building in Florida and Henry was moving. He was the shop manager at that time. He was, he was relocating to Florida. So they ended up moving me up to manager um, of the North Carolina shop. And I was still driving as well. Just, just, you know, on a limited basis. So when I when I started working for Monster Jam around late 2014 and 15, uh, I remember doing a few shows with you, like in Oakland, California, and Roanoke. For, no, not Roanoke. That was Zimmer, uh, Oakland, California, and I think a couple others. Uh, you know, you had some, uh, you know, pretty good crew guys. Let's just say, um, you know, uh, you oh, know, Dan Stansel, Rick Steffens. Yeah. I mean, now he's rocking the Samson truck. Uh, yep. You know, yeah, you had a lot of good crew guys underneath your wing during the 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 third the, the, the recent run with you and uh, your the Monster Jam trucks that you drove. Well, especially especially Grave Digger. But how were they as crew guys? Because now some of them are 
you know, Dave is now Ryan Anderson's crew guy. Rick's driving Samson uh, and yeah. others. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah, that is cool, man. I, I love hearing those stories because that's that's how I started out. And uh, yeah, Rick Rick was always really good. I mean, he was that guy that I'd come come out there and 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 ask him, "Hey, did you get this done? Did you get that done?" And I didn't think he had enough time to do it. I'm like, "Ain't no way." He got, and I start checking behind him, and all right, it's done. And then Stancil was the same kind of guy, you know. They were they were really they really work their butt off and you know what it takes. You, you got to, you, there's so much behind the scenes going on. And then, but then later on after them guys, you know, I had Dave Baldwin and I had Scott Phillips, those guys, they helped get me through there at the end too. So my last couple of years driving. And, uh, and so you come around and you also move to Florida too, and the lovely weather <laughs> and, uh, how was uh, the 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 aspect of not driving a semi anymore? Uh, you know, do you miss driving the semi going to places to places? I I did as far as like the fun we would have sometimes, but then you know there was there was a lot of um, I don't know. It just it took so many more hours away from you to have to drive that rig where I could fly home and be back home with the family you know, in a matter of matter of an evening or the next morning or whatever compared to two days driving or something, you know? So we're going to yeah. throw a wrench into this monster truck world and then we're going to enter the world of music. Brad's going to be on here in a little bit, but man, you're one hell of a musician, especially a guitarist. I know you were listening a little bit, doing a little bit of the bass, but um, man, how did that get started? The love of playing the guitar and music, uh in general my dad played guitar so that's how i that's how i started i learned the old country chords i actually started learning country music old hank williams stuff that he did and stuff like that and um and i basically just went from there on my own and uh used to take the old cassette players and stop and rewind a little bit play a little bit try to figure it out note by note when i started playing um, heavier stuff like Led Zeppelin. And then I went on to even harder stuff, Ozzy Osbourne and Quiet Ride. I was all into that whole um, Van Halen and everything. So the the bands I was in as a teenager and stuff, that's what we were playing, Van Halen, ACDC, stuff like that. And, uh, and now that I'm older, I'm kind of going backwards, you know, slowing back down. I still love playing that stuff, though. And and I can't. Whenever I've got my guitar on, at some point or another, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit a preset with distortion and play Ozzy or Eddie Van Halen or something. So I, I joined back in at the right time. Music, one of my other. We passions. actually started. We started right there. The music, <laughs> as soon as you sat down, I was like, I'm gonna throw a wrench in this. We're we're done for right now. Talking about monster trucks. <laughs> I, I love it. Hey, hey, music. music's like. Hey, I got a, like a couple of like vinyls sitting beside me, like you know yeah man look gotta have the vinyls man Vinyl. Yeah, hey oh, his hits oh my brian brian may that's his name right yeah yeah he, so, he just got so, yeah i just so, got that for my birthday from my daughters oh, <laughs> that's okay. awesome nice. so you know with, with with music you know and you know myself being a drummer you know i can somewhat half-ass play guitar i'm not good at it I, but I'm more, I'm more of a drummer, you know, talk about, you know, the, the importance of, you know, staying to your craft, you know, and that, that can even be with monster trucks too. And, and, and the time that it takes to learn, you know, and, and you're mentioning, you know, you would, you know, have the cassette, you play a little bit of the song, stop it. Then you try to figure that out, you know, figure out the chords yeah. and, and what they're playing. Talk about, you know, the, the practicing and staying, you know, it's, I'm trying to think of the right words. <laughs> you, we, I think you got it there, Brad. Yeah, yeah it's just so, much, so much repetition involved, and and um, and we we kind of want to look for shortcuts. Like nowadays, you got I can go and and YouTube anything. I can look it up on YouTube and probably probably find out how to play it pretty quick. The thing is, I won't remember it tomorrow. Yeah. You know, when I got to figure it out myself, you know, I'm I'm 
training my ear musically for one thing and then i'm just driving it in there and uh and i know i'm, I'm talking about something right now that i'm not really good at I, I forget songs so bad it's crazy but all those ones that i that that i spent so many hours doing that i still remember most of them i just don't remember songs that i learned you know recently because i'm doing exactly what i was just talking about i remember when i was in middle school and there was a like a CV, uh, not CVH, uh, like a, a Walgreens or a Rite Aid, and go to the magazine aisle, and there was a m guitar magazine, like every single month or every single not month, but that came out with a magazine, like I guess every month, I guess so. And at the back of the magazine, the guitar magazine, there was tabs. There was pages of tabs of your favorite song, like "Enter the Same by Man" by Metallica or "Working Man" by Rush. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, songs like that that would have all the guitar tabs. I thought that was like Chinese lettering, but <laughs> <laughs> but you know, so uh, you know, I mean, it's just stuff. Uh, I learned in the fly. I try to learn how to play bass and stuff like that. So <laughs> uh, I only know one really one song, and that's "Money" by uh, uh, Pink, Floyd. Pink Floyd. And uh, you know, that that's pretty much you know the way my bass history goes, but my, uh, my question, I always wanted to, you know, always ask all the guys that are into music and stuff like that. But what was the very first out uh, your own pocket money wise, your first guitar, my first guitar money wise, like you came over, you went to a music shop and you're like, man, I want that. So I yeah. yeah, it was a Charvel a Charvel guitar. With a Floyd Rose on it. Ooh, it nice. Black. It was white with black and red paint splattered on it. Uh, it was uh that was a really nice guitar. And then um I don't remember what happened anyway. The next one I got, a friend of mine loaned me the money and went and got this other guitar. It was a Jack it was a Jackson copy, but it was so good. I mean the it was neck through and everything. You wouldn't if the name was not on the headstock, you wouldn't know the difference. But um yeah, a friend of mine, Eddie, one of my best friends, loaned me the money, and I ended up getting that and paying him back later, and still have that one. I'm I've got it all apart right now, actually, uh, so I can sand it all down and get it repainted. So, what what guitarists do you look up to? Like, you know, obviously before we got on, we were talking about Stevie Ray Vaughan, one of the best of all time, one of my all time favorite guitarists. But talk about you know the the inspirations. You also mentioned you know Eddie Van Halen. Um, who who were the guys that you grew up with? You know, you know, idolizing and still watch to this day. Definitely uh, Eddie Van Halen and Stevie Ray Vaughan. I'm, I'm actually learning pride and joy. Now I've, I've learned bits and pieces of it, but I've, I've, I'm determined to learn the whole song and uh, actually reached out to Jimmy. Um, how do you say his last name? Majora's Menez. Is it? Um, I didn't want to say it wrong. I probably did, but yeah. Mirez, maybe. Yeah. I should know he was an event director for monster jam and he came over and, and played Stevie Ray Vaughan and sang it like, like nobody's business. And, uh, and I called him or I no, I messaged him and asked him about Stevie Ray, how to do you the Stevie Ray song. What if he had any tips and he just sent me a video of him playing it, you know, with just him by himself and exactly what I needed. So, cause I, I'm, I'm mostly a lead player. So the lead stuff is easier for me than the actual rhythm on that song and pride and joy. He's doing a lot of muting strings in between. There's a lot of stuff going on that you don't realize until you really try to play it. So I was watching about Stevie Ray Vaughan and have you tried to master his, um, he does a, a circular, uh, instead of up and down, he plays it a lot. Like, uh, like, so there's, there's a string, but he's making a little mute or a gap between each progression. Uh, you know, the type of the unique stuff that Stevie Ray Vaughan does, but uh, have you tried to, you know, master some of the little tweaks that he has? Do yeah. Uh, so that's going on in the song I'm learning. So at the same time, I'm trying to learn new things with my left hand. I'm trying to learn new things with my right hand. And it's uh, it's a challenge, you know, because you don't want to rush it. And then you learn it wrong. You, you just, you're never going to do it right. So, so I'm just, taking little baby steps with it. I feel like I, I almost feel like I'm learning guitar all over again because it's, it's so, it's so different for me. 
you know, from what I've learned up to this point. You know, it's funny when you were mentioning about, you know, all the songs that you've learned. Sometimes you forget most of them. Like I play drums in a uh, church here where I live. You know, I've been playing the drums there for 10 years. And like there's songs that I know off by heart and songs that I've played in, like hundreds of hundreds of times. And it gets one song gets out of the set list. Like, do I remember how to play this one? Like I've played this one a bunch, but I can't remember it. <laughs> Yeah, I go through that all the time. Songs I write, I've even wrote songs, and somebody asked me to play it two months later. And play that song you posted on Facebook. Oh, I ain't even played it since then. <laughs> well, 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 speaking of the song you wrote, um, Nathan Smith asked a question here. Um, what's the story behind the song Get Up, and was it planned to be an intro song for Monster Jam? It, was, it wasn't planned to be, I guess... Uh, I shouldn't speak for them, but on my end, um, it was just just something cool I was trying to do, and and hopefully they would use it if they didn't, whatever. And and uh, I think it was Adam Anderson helped me get it in front of the right people, and then they they said, okay, let's send him to the uh, send him to Nashville and record it. So they paid paid for everything, sent me there, we recorded it, and they just decided to to do what they were doing, which was me getting up there and, and basically singing the song while the track was playing in the background and uh, at certain shows. And that was, they never used it for a, like a full-time monster jam song for whatever reason. I don't, I don't know, but I had fun with it. Uh, well, it's the number one hit at the shop with Nathan caught Nader jam. So uh, uh, yeah, we let <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that all the time. Uh, yeah. Good morning wake up call. Um, nice. Now, is there any favorite riffs that you sometimes like to play? Like you get the guitar and you're like, okay, you know, just just tootling along before you start hitting a song hard. Seems like I always end up playing a little bit of uh, Crazy Train and uh, um, Ain't Talking About Love, Van Halen. Because I've known that one forever. Um, That's a killer riff, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. And uh, I can tell when I when I get this Stevie Ray Vaughan song down, it's going to be it's going to be one I'm going to want to play a lot. Because it's well, fun. Uh, this comment is since we're on the music thing from uh, Dan's teammate, Kurt Kramer. What is your favorite Mushroom Head song? <laughs> He's just a random. Just give me a heads up. If you know the band, you know the band. If you know it, you don't. He's got to ask the question anyway. So that's going to be another ongoing question. Uh, not the can of soup, but Mushroom Head, the band from Cleveland. So uh. I haven't heard them yet, man. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, then, then, then I'll do I'll this. Favorite Metallica song? It's, I'm just going to say Inner Sandman because that's the first one that comes to mind. But I don't know. There's There's so many of them. That's my all-time favorite band. It's it's all. I can't wait for S and M two to come out next week. I am way too excited about that. To be honest with you, oh yeah, I've heard yeah. about that. Yeah, well, that's I really have rock star, right? Yeah, it's the when they opened up the Chase Center or whatever in San Francisco. They uh, they did it in two thousand or ninety nine, I believe, with Michael Kamen when he was the director of the uh, San Francisco Symphony Orchestra. But now they're redoing it, but adding a bunch of new songs off their last couple of albums. So it's going to be exciting to, to hear. And like Metallica is one of those bands. It's just classic. Like no matter, except St. Anger, Load and Reload. I really don't think anything of those three albums at all. Uh, except for the song Fuel. Yes. Oh, a friend of mine, when I was a teenager, a friend of mine, uh, uh, well, I'd go pick him up in my Mustang. And he always had his Metallica cassette he put in there. And I remember on that one, I liked Battery. Oh, uh, yeah. Mas that was Master of Puppets album first song. Yep. I honestly like the guitar, the not guitar, Garage Inc. album, the ones that they did covers on. I always thought that was pretty good, like Turn the Page and Overkill and and all those. I thought that was pretty fun of the uh, music in general. But um, I don't know how to ex ask this question or you know uh, talk about this, but. We're going to go back to maybe a micro millisecond of monster trucks. Um, you, you stepped behind, you stepped away from behind the wheel of the, the monster jam truck in general. And 
uh, you had to take some time off. And uh, yep. uh, for a, a con- uh, I guess, a mental condition that people may not know about. Um, and what was it and how are you feeling today? So it, it's, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia in 2018. It's basically a syndrome of several different symptoms combined. And it's, it's really, there's really a lot of different theories because the worst thing about it is people who have it, you can't see anything wrong with them. You can't, their, their tests come back normal. When we get tested for things, they come back normal, but we have a lot of, a lot of pain. Um, some doctors now are calling it um, something oversensitized um, nerves syndrome, something like that, where you just, your nerves are damaged and they're just too sensitive to anything like sunlight, all those things. Um, but yeah, it, the, the worst part has been for me has been the fatigue stuff. Um, I could, it's not like your normal fatigue where you're tired because you worked 10 or 12 hours or something. It's, it's a fatigue where your body is just, you're ready to collapse where you're just literally on bad days when I just taking a shower, washing my hair. Um, by the time I'm done, I'm, I'm starting to get out of breath because that just took all my energy. Um, so then if you don't go ahead and rest right then and you try to push through it, you could end up, you'll just be worse for the next two, three, who knows how many days. So you have to learn that's, and I have always say that, um, this be the worst. This has to be the worst thing I could have got because, because I have no patience and I have to have patience with this. Um, so and that's been that's been tough too accepting it, you know. Um, but some of the things I've figured out um, because when this happened and, and my boss asked me how long you think this has been going on, I said, knowing what I know now, it's been going on several years. Um, all the way back to when I was managing the North Carolina shop and I got, I had to go to the hospital was kept overnight. They couldn't find anything wrong with me, but my, my pulse was low and they wouldn't let me leave. They kept me overnight because my, my pulse was too low. They couldn't get it up. And, uh, and some of those things are all looking back. Now I know why, why I was hurting more than other people were while I was, I thought I was getting old. I'll be, I, I really thought it was the age, you know, but I was, as I was flying to the West coast and coming back and, and the, the uh, jet lag was, was taking like two days to get over. And uh, when it got, when it, when it got to the point of right before I couldn't work anymore at the, in Florida there, I was, I noticed it. I'd be out mowing the grass with the push mower and I'd, push three streaks with a push mower and I'm out of breath. And I'm like, and so what I, I was working out harder, I started pushing myself harder and it was actually the opposite of what I needed to be doing. I didn't know. So I was getting up at five in the morning, working out, doing all kinds of cardio exercises, push ups, everything I could do before I even went into the office and all that stuff was just built up to the point where it finally just took me out and I was bedridden and, uh, and couch ridden for for a while and i would get a little bit of energy late in the evening and then next day start over the same thing so um it's been it's been a struggle but i'm still optimistic i was i had made a, a huge i had made huge gains doing keto the keto diet and and i was doing one meal a day because there's something called autophagy where your body will will go into a a recycle basically of your get rid of bad cells, replace them with new. So I was, I had been, when I'm laying there, I'm doing all this research on how can I fix myself, you know? And then that was what I tried and and I made a lot of progress. And then I got a sinus infection, strep throat, and it just set me back. So then I went for about a month. I was, I was back on the riding the couch and, uh, so now I'm working my way back up from that and slowly getting there. And I've agreed to, for some doctors to, to try some medications again, because at that point I, I had got rid of all the medications. I wasn't taking anything, no, no pain medicine, no nothing. 
and right now I'm letting them experiment with it's I'm still not doing any kind of pain medication, but um, just trying to get if I if I can get that energy back, then then I'll be uh, I'll be making a some huge progress. That's my goal right now. You know, and that's, you know, for me, my girlfriend who's watching right now, um, she she has fibromyalgia and I, I'm st I'm trying to learn, you know, about it. My and my uh, auntie does as well. And I'm trying to learn as much as I can to be able to help my girlfriend out and, you know, make sure that, you know, I can be more understanding of what she goes through on a day to day basis. And, you know, lately it, it's, you know, she's dealing with, you know, a fractured uh, ankle and a fractured shoulder now. And it, the, the fibromyalgia just makes that pain worse. And it's just, you know, just hearing that and hearing your story, you know, it's, you know, you're able to push through and, you know, you're, you're still, you know, kicking butt today. And, you know, even though you had those setbacks, you know, you're, you're still trying to figure it out and get the, get the help, you know, to, to fight it. And, you know, that was really cool for me to hear just because, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to learn more about it myself so I can be more um, able to help my girlfriend out. Yeah. And and this the best thing you can do is, you know, she's going to probably know when the days she can't push herself. Those are the days when when the the fatigue is really bad. Like I was saying, you get out of breath. I could be walking around talking on the phone and get out of breath. Then I know that's a bad day. I can't push myself to do anything that day. I have to. I have to stop myself because if I do anything on that day, I might be on the couch for two or three days after. So it's, it's really, it's hard to uh, comprehend. It's still, I have it and it's hard for me to comprehend. And uh, you know, I'm in a couple of groups on Facebook and looking at, at what some of those people who have had it for 30, 40 years and they, they haven't had any luck. You know, it's, it's, I still feel like I am. Um, I'm. I, I'm grateful. I should say that right now, my mine is a lot better than theirs. It, there's some other people that are on there that are actually working and and doing better than I am. So that's my goal to get to where they're at. Um, but it's tough, and she's got to keep fighting, and you got to be able to support her um, and understand if she says she can't do it, then. You got the biggest thing you could do, because like I said, you we don't look like anything's wrong with us. So you have to you have to believe, believe what she's saying and support her. And and that uh, I don't know if y'all seen my post. I did. I was talking about um, the difference between this fatigue and just somebody that was being somebody that was had worked all day. And I talked about I used to work on a monster truck team and we worked a hundred hours a week. I didn't want anybody to think I was like bragging about working about how I could work back in those days. What I was trying to do was, was paint the picture of I'm not somebody that, that is, uh, that was a slack ass, you know, when I had a job to do, I did it. So I just, that was my way of trying to say, um, you got to believe me if I'm telling you I'm this fatigued and, uh, and I can't push through it. You got to believe me. I'm not that guy that's just going to use this as excuse to lay on the couch all day. So that that's the way that's the way it makes you feel, you know, and being the man that, that's supposed to be the provider when you're you go through you go through so many things. Um, depression. I've had to go through a few bouts of depression. Um and that's definitely not easy. So I'm still kicking though. The music, the music and my, and my kids, they get me through it. So uh, let's, we got, some fan, <laughs> we got some fan interaction here and we got a couple questions and stuff we'll go through. Uh, we'll get through, uh, we're going to get through all of them for them. Uh, any, some of them are popping up anyway, but the first one, uh, we got here uh, actually uh, a shout out to Aaron Cromer. He said uh, you got him, he got his foot into the door, uh, got him uh, with Randy Brown and, and you gave him some advice on the phone and stuff like that. He, Aaron Cromer uh, drove for Rick Rab and the American guardian and anger management uh, before uh, he sold those trucks up North. But uh, yeah, he, he gave you some love. 
But uh, the yeah. first, uh, first question was, I, I'm going to screw up your last name, I'm sorry, but Thomas was saying, could you tell us about the story when you rolled Gravedigger in intros? That must have been in Phoenix in uh, 2000. That, the only reason I remember this because somebody just brought it up. I was watching a podcast a couple of weeks ago and somebody brought it up and uh, I said, oh, that was me. But yeah, I think they said 2012. That sounds about right. I was in Gravedigger and uh, there was this big pad up up top the way they had made some of those um, SoCal style tracks. I don't know if you remember them. Had a big area up on the top where the uh, trucks could go across side by side. Anyway, they wanted me to do donuts on top of that for intros. And I said, man, that's too tacky up there. Just that's what we want you to do. Like 10-4, buddy. So <laughs> here comes intros and I whipped it on in there and committed to the donut and uh, it hooked up. And when it did, I, I turned back into it and put it to the floor. And I, so I walked sidewall donuts all the way down the other side of the hill and hit a car roll over or something, you know, one of the crushed cars they had sitting there. And uh, yeah, that was it. So the bad thing was what was the worst was I was so hard on that engine trying to save it that it, it locked up in freestyle. Um, I got like halfway through freestyle. I, I got up on two wheels. They hit the dumpster and it kind of, the dumpster saved me. So I drove off the dumpster and then they shut me off and, you know, I not getting mad at them. I, I know I look frustrated, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we always love them. RII radios. <laughs> um, but, but I understand. Um, anyway, long story short, when they shut me off, when I went to start it back up, it was locked up, which was due to my my uh, eight grand sidewall donut, <laughs> I'm sure. But maybe if I hadn't got shut off, it would have got me through 60 more seconds. I don't know. You never know. So the next question uh, comes from Briar Smith. He asks, hey, CVH, what was your all time favorite Monster Jam memory in your career? Man, all time favorite memory. That is, uh, well, I know, you know, one, one that don't even have to do with a race that was really, really cool for me was driving Gravedigger down the Las Vegas Strip with all the other Gravedigger drivers, you know, just making that, that parade lap. But, um, other than that, I, I still, I still go back to, that first race because I was that first race in Spider-Man that was on TNN because, you know, I was a rookie. I hadn't, I hadn't even driven in a stadium yet. That was my first stadium, my first TV show. And I'm up against all the big guns, Lyle, Tom, um, Guy Wood was driving bulldozer. Um, I can't remember the rest right this minute. Uh, but but yeah, ended up winning my first ever TV show as a rookie, in my first stadium in Tampa. So that's that's got to be uh, my top one. We got another one, and it's a future monster truck uh, driver, uh, the son of Zane Two, CJ Two, and he said, uh, did, uh, "What was what is one moment in your monster truck career that after you got out of a truck, you were like, wow, that was a crazy ride." That's I had a lot of crashes. I'm sure y'all have seen that, but uh, <laughs> there's one that I'll never, that, that nothing else compared to. And that was in T-Max racing, racing Tom Mintz in uh, West Lebanon. And I had been doing some summer shows because, you know, with SIR, uh, we would do some other shows outside of Monster Jam and smaller ramps you know if the ramps are fairly small and you're getting a little sideways coming to them you don't have to let off you can you can take it the truck can take it well if you go to west lab back in this back in this day and time the ramps were pretty stout and if you if you start getting a little sideways you better lift and get straight before you before you hit it well i'm racing tom mints i decided i wasn't going to lift and uh and it, and it it started 
getting a little sideways on me and and i just followed through with it and that thing tumbled i don't know how many times um when it was done the uh the transmission it was like three inches between the transmission coupler and the transfer case is how much it moved and unhooked um, the roll cage was smashed in on one side and everything. So I was, I was done, done for the week. Um, cause those shows were what Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Uh -huh. And I was done. Um, we had the other truck and Zimmer had to finish the, the next couple of shows. And I even had dizzy spells for the next two days. Anyway, I couldn't even hardly walk around. I, I called it shaking baby syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> My head was in there doing. <laughs> <clears throat> Got wow. another uh, comment here from Randy White. He asks, Carl, how's the real estate venture going? <laughs> hey, Randy. Good to see you. Hear from you, whatever. Friend, Randy's my friend out in Fresno. But yeah, real uh, real estate right now is, is on hold. Um, my partner in Tampa, my partner in crime there, he's he's killing it. Jason Brown in Tampa. So if anybody's looking in Tampa, let me know. I'll hook you up with Jason. But uh, yeah, we, I had some, I enjoyed that. I was doing it on the side kind of when I was at the end of my, my deal um, while I was still working at field. And uh, here are some shout outs to uh, Mr. Mark Hansen. He said, uh, love you. Mean it. Miss your brother. <laughs> Miss you too, Mark. Love uh, you. Mean it. Yeah, I used to say that to some of the guys out there. Um, and I want to say hello to Aaron Cromer. I didn't get a chance to a while ago. So, hey, Aaron, appreciate you, man. Um, another question, uh, me personally, was, uh, uh, you know, uh, Fred, speaking about Fresno, I think it was around 2005, you gave the wheel of your grave digger to B.J. Johnson. And uh, and uh, he ran basically around his hometown uh, arena, and uh well the truck didn't come back to what it was supposed to be that's all right and <laughs> yeah. I, I always know i always know when it goes it's it's a grave digger you know and i wasn't one of them one of them drivers if i ask if i need somebody to fill in for me i'm not gonna say hey don't hurt the truck i'm gonna say hey go out there and and do what those fans want you to do and vj did that just like everybody else who filled in for me it was it was uh i mean adam adam took it one weekend in, in detroit and had a hell of a ride won his championship with it yeah yeah you know uh, sky hartley uh message saying uh it's been a while mr carl hey sky i don't know why i said that louder like <laughs> <laughs> you're all excited about it. Up in i gotta say it louder <laughs> How yeah, can you hear me up there? <laughs> All right, Cheech, do you think it's time? Oh, we got one more, I guess, that Mackenzie Ray person. I mean, yeah, asked a question. Uh, okay, uh, right yeah, here. about uh, Hooters or G.T. Smiths? In yeah, Anaheim? so um, uh, Levi Shones um, always asks a question on MonsterCast because they have like certain people that I interview on there. Um, Hooters or J.T. Schmitz? Hooters, baby. Nice. Oh, well, man. the only reason why I like going to the Hooters at Anaheim was unlike, you know, Dustin and all of them, there was a flight simulator, a big flight simulator across the street. We found that out from Josh Dyke and all of them. And uh, we were, it was the 2016 FS1 tour. You know, the, we were with you a couple shows when you guys did that exhibition freestyle, the fill in time. Um, we went there and they had, you had to either, they had four, the full, like a fuselage of like F-16, F-14. It's a big building, a really big building, <laughs> F-22. And you sit in the cockpit and the airplane moves. Everything moves. If you're going up, you're going up, you're going down, you're going down, stuff like that. And we played that fighter game. It was like 30 bucks for like two hours. It was awesome. Uh, uh, one of our third guys, remember uh, Anthony? Anthony, uh, he was crew chiefing for uh, uh, Randy Brown uh, this year and uh, last year. Uh, he was uh, 
think Dustin Brown's their guy for that. He won the competition. And then they had this thing for like, if you paid like a hundred more dollars, you'll get training on a 737, like the full fledged yeah. simulator. That's the only reason why I like going to there, but you know, JT is pretty good also, but I mean, it, uh, I found out later on going straight to Hooters and then go straight across the street. It was worth it. I can have either lose my food or throw up, but I didn't. So it, it is what it is, but still, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, we have like two hard hitting questions. These, and, these, these uh, are the most hard hitting questions. You, you think you've had, you know, hard hitting questions. You haven't had uh, nothing yet, man. Oh boy. Mm. Oh boy. Are you ready? And, and, and one of them has to deal with those pesky Norman brothers. Oh, oh. Those guys. <laughs> Those guys. <laughs> I got a feeling you got some funny stories about Phil. Before we ask the question, you got any funny stories with Phil? Phil used to be our, you know, I used to be able to talk him into telling a joke in the morning. Remember the morning meetings we had? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Phil was dead set on being a comedian there for a little while. So I like, come on and tell everybody a joke. And then he kind of. He got tired of doing it after a while. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, until, until after mornings when we all like get the work, then oh, he's yeah. cracking jokes all day long. And, <laughs> I'm and sure. it's like, you know, it's, it was you just need a, that guy, man. You need that guy. That's what, that's what I used to love to do before. And even when I became a manager, uh, especially in North Carolina, I was, I was a little bit more free to walk around and tell a joke to the guys while they're working just to, make you forget about you know how aggravated you might be on on whatever you've been working on for the past three hours but uh yeah you need that guy on, in the workplace that just makes you forget everything and, and tells a joke here or there and cracks you up all right so here we go we're going to do reverse mode here brad since okay. we've been talking about the normans are you for or against eggnog i don't like it Yes! yes, we hate eggnog. It tastes bad. Oh. That's tough. Like when someone told me, it's like eggnog's like fruit cake. It's just nasty. But fruit cake, fruit's good. Cake, great. Fruit cake, nasty crap. Right? Yeah, I'm with you. I agree. <laughs> and, and, and I still have to drink a gallon of eggnog because the Edmonton Oilers lost in the play-in series against Chicago. So yeah, I couldn't handle that. Well, nope. Chicago Ooh. got beat by Las Vegas. Yes, so, so payback. But you still have to drink what. a gallon of eggnog. I know, it's going to happen. So I, hear I, me out here, Carl. I'm thinking about making this big event. So, Sky, you're banned. You're never going to be on. I'm just kidding, Sky. We'd love to have you on. Um, no, we're going to try to do a big event, like like uh, make a big intro video and everything like that, and spend like 30 minutes talking about Brad's eggnog thing. And then we'll talk about it again for an extra 20 minutes. And then Brad has like 15 minutes to drink his eggnog before Discovery Channel shuts us off. <laughs> I thought it'd be not Discovery, like history or something. Like some big scravaganza. Like a, like a, but I don't know. I think we're going to see some uh, upchucking going on if he no, drinks. No, I'm, I'm not going to chuck it. But anyways, uh, <laughs> our, our, <laughs> our second question, which has been chug, a chug, since, chug, chug, chug. since the early days of the podcast. Um, and, uh, you know, it comes from our buddy, Brandon Culpepper senior shout out to Brandon. What is your favorite kind of pie? Favorite kind of pie. Oh man. That's easy for me. Pumpkin. Oh, that's, that's still second. Sweet potato. Still second. They're right. They're right there. Pumpkin and sweet potato. Oh, okay. they're, they're, so they're if you pick pumpkin, that's third. I know this because my noggin sweet potato would be in, uh, Five uh, being fifth over uh, uh, twenty saw uh, twenty one one like like a twenty way tie with that. We'll see Tuesday. Mark Bendler said apple, but he also said lemon meringue and another one. So uh, he says he was a pie connoisseur. So we we you know it's all it's all good, you know. Um, but uh, we we also have also. Uh, do you have any uh, funny rental car stories that's clean that won't get you blackmailed or blacklisted? Let me think, man. 
the last the last one that wasn't too terrible. Um, I wasn't terrible with rental cars, but you know, I did try some things. Somebody <laughs> bet, somebody told me they were talking about doing burnouts, and I had a Chevy Cruze that weekend. You know, there's little things that won't even hardly get out of their own way. <laughs> yeah. There's no way you'll be able to do a, a burnout in that. And I had Rick Steffens with me so he can verify this. I said, well, we're going to do a burnout. And I, and there happened to be a speed bump behind the motel. I got up to the speed bump because I tried it first with it, with it um, straight on regular pavement. It wouldn't do it. It just blew. And it started dragging the brakes. And, uh, got up against that speed bump and I burnt them things that one tire down. I mean, it was, there was a nice cloud of smoke and we, we hauled butt out of there and we uh, and killed some time before we came back to the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here, here's uh, another one of a uh, question. It's kind of personal for me. Like I asked Dustin Brown about this and I loved his answer because it was just, I, I was shocked. So you, you've done a lot of shows in Canada, correct? You know, you've yep. been up. Okay. Dunkin' Donuts or Tim Hortons? Tim Hortons. Yes! Yes, yes, yes. And you know, it, I'm, I was uh, on the road with John Zimmer. So I don't know if you ask him that question, but John Zimmer is a Tim Hortons um, yeah. kind of fanatic. Sort of, you call him? Yeah, yeah, fanatic. Hey, yeah. he, he, even That's Dustin cool. knew exactly. He, I was like, what's your order? He's like, a double-double. I'm just like, yes, you know the lingo and everything. <laughs> I wasn't a big coffee drinker, but I was I was went in there with uh Zimmer all the time. But hey, we always know that high octane coffee, which is right, it's going across the screen. Um, stop, 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 stop. Uh, That's right. I uh, do drink coffee now. Hey, enjoy uh, Sylvester's high octane coffee. Get the bad right habit. There, right there, right there. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he gets a bunch of stuff go uh you know, high octane coffee.com or Google high octane coffee, and I'll take you right there. But uh, Carl, uh, we're going to close up shop here, but, uh, anything you want to say to your fans that, uh, love to see you on today, tonight? Hmm? Oh man. If, if I was just thinking about something, this might take me a few minutes if y'all don't mind. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Right. yeah. So, you know, once, once I started learning more about my condition and, and figuring out what was going on with me, um, I realized that, you know, it had been going on for several years and, you know, the guys there, Dustin, Mark, them guys will tell you, I was Frank Krimmel. We talked about it. Um, but I was having problems getting out of breath in the truck, you know? So that was those, those last few years of me driving, I was really dreading freestyle, you know, but I knew I really wanted to, I always wanted to make sure the fans got their money's worth. You know, that was just me. But um, I don't even know, you know, going all the way back to probably like 2012 or 13, um, I think it was spotty then, you know what I mean? Because some of them, it was good. Like, I remember the, the New Orleans freestyle in 2013. I wasn't out of breath at all, whole freestyle. But then other ones, I would, as soon as that happened to me, that was that was part of this condition that was coming on, I, and I had no idea. So, um so I felt like um, if I would have known, if I would have known what was going on and knew how to predict when it was going to happen, I would have said, you know, somebody get in there that can do this freestyle, you know, the way that it needs to be done for the fans. The one specific time to it that I remember that, that because anytime my adrenaline, the more my adrenaline gets going, the more fatigue happens faster. So the, uh, that last time I drove Son of a Digger in Phoenix. Um, okay, in 2016. What's the new stadium? Uh, yeah, in that, it wasn't State in Farm. The, State Farm Stadium. Yeah, it was over there in the big football stadium. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and I'm thinking before the show. Okay, Ryan, I'm gonna try to drive like Ryan. I got to, I got to go. A lot of momentum, so I pumped myself up even more than usual. And I didn't make it halfway through and I could not breathe. I had to stop the truck. And then I think people were asking me and, and I, and it was going to take so long to type all that in on a Facebook question. I never answered it. So that was, 
I, I actually went to the doc when I got back. I went to the doctor and he gave me some. He didn't know what he, he said. It was some kind of viral lung infection, but my x-rays were clean. So knowing what I know now, it was fibromyalgia the whole time. So um, had I known, I would have never. Um, never drove the truck knowing that I couldn't do the job. So I just do want the fans to know that um, always, always had nothing but the best intentions to give them the best show that I was capable of and always appreciated the fans. And we are, we are thankful for, you know, the entertainment that you got, that you have brought to us, you know, you know, going back all the way to the TNN days for myself. You know, I remember watching those very vividly. And, you know, um, one one last question here um, from Aaron Cromer. He says, ask Carl about Podell Wilkins. Just a CB character. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> CB character, you know, we, we would make up names and, and just talk stupid on the CB. And, uh, I did that with so many different people going up and down the road. Um, Dennis Anderson, we did that some and, and uh, B Winston, me and him had some fun times doing that. Randy Brown, all them guys, Jeff Sin, Alex Blackwell. There's so many of them. I'll forget. I'll forget them. But, uh, but yeah. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor ego CB characters. <laughs> That were a good time. <laughs> we one time, me and Dennis were me and Dennis were talking so much crap. We were worried that when we went to the toll booth, that somebody, another trucker, was gonna realize it was us and <laughs> and come yank us out of the truck. Actually, what, one other quick question: Any Mike Wine stories? Because we've had Mike on the podcast, and he has millions of stories. Always, do you have any anything you could say about Mike Wine? Prankster, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he got me good. Yeah, yep, he got me good one time in a hotel room. Um, uh, let's just say there was a smell in the bathroom. So when I went in there, and then people came in there behind me, he made everybody think it was mine. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty funny. Oh, <laughs> that guy swears it, it was bad. Swears. It was bad. I'm telling you. He tells people, I even know mama, it him, but but he, that's he made it look like it was it was mine. So funny stuff. He, he always says that his mom always made an angel. So ooh, <laughs> some man, some made big effort. But uh, you know, it, it's cool having you on. Thank you for being on and also being on. You know, short timing. Uh, it was great having you, and uh, I, I would, would love to have yeah. you again. Yeah, man, just call me anytime. I appreciate it and um, appreciate y'all doing this. Um, I'm going to try to catch more of your, your shows. And um, thanks to everybody who's who's asked questions and said hello on Facebook or wherever. And miss you guys a lot. Uh, everybody, you know, like I said, if I start calling out names, I'll forget half of them. But everybody that I've ever met and along the way, man, I, I miss y'all and I love you. Nice, nice. Well, everyone, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for our sponsors, High Octane Coffee, uh, J Concepts, Back Channel Productions, uh, Marty Garza's book, Monster Truck Technology, 6B Apparel, and JB Scale Graphics. And also, you guys can get our T-shirts at Below the Collar. Yeah, BelowTheCollar.com backslash crush this podcast. And also, go check out uh, Renegade Monster Truck Tours, Andrew Two and his company, uh, doing some shows around the Pennsylvania area. Go check out the, what they're doing. Um, yeah. Any, any last words, Cheech and Carl? Uh, this Tuesday, David Morris in the Equalizer, uh, 1989, 1997 champion. Uh, we'll talk to him. Uh, a lot of people say he has some funny stories, a funny guy Thursday. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know who I'm going to have on. Uh, you know, it was supposed to be Carl, but well, <laughs> let's switch it all through. So, uh, I got to find uh, someone to be on for next Thursday. It could and, be anyone. It could be a guy. I'm going to think of a, maybe the Facebook Live of a bum on the street. Uh, and hey, um, it, could, it could just be me and Cheech hanging out, watching old be. videos, guys. You know, right now, right now, yeah. 
But uh, September 1st will be Brian Loans. Yep, right? I'm going to make sure I'm going to confirm that with Brian. Um, you know, go check out what he's doing on NHRA on Fox. U.S. Mm-hmm. Nationals coming up soon. So I'm going to be excited to have him on there. And just right. thank you guys for all the, the all the support and the love. And uh, it means a lot to all of us um, with what me and Chicha have been able to do here. And even go, go guys, go check out Monster Cast and the Monster Truck Outlaws of the West. Go check even out Even though they don't show us love, except for Cam. Love you, Cam. <laughs> Take care on your load, on your bike. But, you know, we'll show love to everyone else. But, you know, it's all good. We're, we'll, we'll do our thing. So Your class act for doing that. Hey, yeah. hey, we're, we're, I consider us kind of the grandfathers of the whole Monster Truck podcast. I feel so anyway. old now. <laughs> hey, I'm turning oh, no, 30. No, 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 turning... no. The, grand, the grandfather is always going to be Monster Truck Radio. Yeah. Richard we're, Roller. We're, we're, we're the next, we were the next generation of that. So, yeah. But you know what? It, we're just giving those guys crap because, you know, we, not, not crap. It, it, it's all, no, it's we're all just love. Busting. We're just, it's all love. But, all you love. know, go ahead and give them love too. Uh, those guys at the West Coast, they interview some of the best, uh, the guys out there in the West Coast, uh, same thing with Monster Cast, and you know whoever else is it uh, do it too. There's all sorts of different. Uh, uh, do uh, go ahead and and they do different programs. So you know what? Check out all the format to get your clutch of monster trucks and maybe and everything in general. So yep. yeah. Um, also, you know what? While you're at it, we, this may not be a uh relating moss truck podcast anything but if you guys are in the video games or anything like that th- th- that guy and his brother have some pretty cool s- twitch yeah i don't know what i'm talking about i'll explain go ahead so, go ahead there's a thing on facebook facebook gaming um i'm starting to do a little bit more often playing i racing and stuff my brother, who goes by the name Sir Nickington, streams himself playing Nintendo games um, like Animal Crossing, Super Mario Maker, and stuff like that. If you're interested, guys, go check it out. Yeah, give him a like and a follow. That'd be much appreciated. And, you know, I'm going to be doing it more often here soon. So, um, yeah, go check that out. And sometimes I'll stream on the Crush This page, playing some iRacing or mess around with some of the BMNG Monster Truck stuff. So, trying to be like Carl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and- um, do you also have like a YouTube or if anyone's interested in music or anything like that, uh, CVH that good people can follow or. I do, but I've just been putting everything on Facebook. I, I just started messing with a new song that is coming together pretty good. It's going to be more of a patriotic song. I think that we need right now. So hopefully I'll finish that in the next week or so. And um, a lot of the songs I write, I, I I knock them out in a day or some of them I can do in an hour or two if I'm in the right frame of mind, but I think I'm going to put more time into this one and I'm not going to let, I'm going to just try to make sure it's exactly the way I want it and put more time and make it, make it better. So uh, maybe in a week or so I'll put it out on my Facebook page. Awesome. Well, Carl, thank you so much. Remember Tuesday, David Morris will be on and uh, anything else, Brad, before we uh, shut her down. Nope, just uh, guys, make sure you're checking up on your friends. Make sure their mental health is good. Uh, it's been a year since we lost uh, Mike Thompson. So everybody, go check up on your friends, please. That's so important. As somebody that goes through mental, uh, has two mental uh, health diagnoses myself, please check up on your friends and family. That is the most important thing, especially with what's been going on with COVID-19 and the shutdowns and a lot of stuff happening. Please check up on your family and friends. That is, and also I, one thing, Brad, everyone has time. There's no, if someone, yeah. you know, check up me and him, me and Brad are in two different, I'm closer to CVH than I am to Brad, but I still hit up Brad asking, yeah. you know, hit up, you know, you know, take care, you know, don't, don't do anything stupid. You know yeah. what I mean? Or I'm, I don't want to be saying that, but when I say that, I mean, it's going to hurt a lot peop- a lot more people in the long end than anything else. So- and, and, and I just want to say this quickly, guys. You know, I went three years without taking any medication from ADHD. You know, I'm very vocal about my mental health problems. Having Asperger's and ADHD. I finally just went back on something just over two weeks ago. Greatest decision I've ever made in my life. If you think you're, you have ADHD or something, go talk to a doctor, please. You know, you shouldn't be going through it alone. You shouldn't be dealing with it, you know, without, you know, the help. So, guys, just please check up on your family and friends. Make sure everybody's doing safe. 
get your pets spayed and neutered. And, uh, you know, mm-hmm. as uh, Red Green here in Canada, don't know if you guys know what Red Green is, always says keep your stick on the ice. And, guys, thank you for joining us. Women don't awesome. find me handsome. They sure do find me <laughs> handy. Yeah. And, again, Carl, thank always you for coming on. Me. Thank you for coming on, man. It's been a blast. And, you know, um, as we always say on Crushes on Monster Podcast, everybody, keep the rubber side down and the shiny side up. Peace. Thank you.